Listen, Jimmy, I really need to talk to you. Why won't Gretchen respond? I texted her yesterday. Hey, dot, 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 which is delightfully neutral and decidedly open-ended. Maybe she's not texting you because she knows the only reason you're checking in is to make yourself feel better. <laughs> what? Yeah. Maybe Gretchen wants to get on with her life and never think about you again. Maybe she thought you were dead, Jimmy. Checking tips on the hotline, coming home night after night to an empty house with only your scent on your pillow to cling to for comfort until it too faded away and she was left all alone with nobody to make breakfast ramen for. Alone with, with nothing but her scentless pillows and haunted thoughts of all the friends she lost. What's up, what's up? Thanks for coming back. Hey, thanks for having me back. Happy season four. Thank you. Are you guys in the middle of shooting now, or do you guys basically shoot the whole season, wrap, and then it airs? Yeah, we just got done on Thursday. I flew back to New York Friday afternoon. So that's so cool. That, I mean, that essentially means that the writers and the creators don't really have to respond to the audience throughout the course of the season, right? They have a pretty much a set story that they're working out while you guys yeah, are Yeah, they, 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 you know, they board it all out. They start writing it. They send it over to FX. They give Steven whatever notes they might have. Um, they do a little bit of tweaks towards things at the end of the season, but it's just more like more topical jokes more than anything else, but the main plots of the story are, are set and ready to go before we even get in the room. Right, there was a lock her up chant yeah. in one of the episodes that I just saw, and I was like, ooh, yeah. when did you guys shoot this? <laughs> oh, man, let's, uh, I go, well, we started May 29th, so what was that, episode three or episode four? I think it was episode, episode four. Episode four, yeah. Yeah, we had a, a so it was, uh, I don't know, two months ago now? Two months ago is when you shot that. Yeah. Oh, so he was in office when you shot that. Oh, yeah, he's been in office <laughs> too long. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Has it been four years already? No. No, it has not, unfortunately. Cool. We'll just but go for impeachment. But Yay. time seems to be going by quite... It's like slow and fast at the same time with him in office, right? Like, it feels like it's been five years, but it's been... Yeah, you know. it's like what people tell me now that I have a kid. Like, cherish every moment because the days are incredibly long, but the years are ridiculously short. <laughs> Which is... You know, a cool thing when talking about my son, who I absolutely love, but when we're talking about, you know, the, the idiot that's running our country, then it's not. Yeah, then it's like, it's kind of, it's almost the opposite. In yeah, some like, like, just hope all of it goes by so quickly. Yeah, just try to avoid the moments. Don't yeah. cherish them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so talk to me about uh, what's going on with your character in season four. You know, he's got this comedy writing job for Doug Benson. Mm -hmm. Uh, Doug does sketches, I think it's called. Doug, or Doug loves, loves sketches. Like Doug loves movies, but Doug yeah. loves sketches. <laughs> yeah. How did Doug Benson feel uh, when he was approached to do a kind of? Um, uh, it is kind of a parody of what he already does to a degree. Oh, he's down. We have such a great time on set together, man. I just got done shooting with him. He was actually one of the last scenes that I got to shoot before before we left, and we have this ridiculous scene where I come to confront him at his home. Um, and he's got like uh, this really big swinging door that opens and some model like hanging out in a bathing suit in the pool over his shoulder behind him and he just thinks the ridiculousness of all of it's really really fun yeah but which was like i wish this joke about my life was my actual life well yeah i mean i think we all i i, I think he definitely wishes he had a model just hanging out in his pool whenever he wanted i mean that would be fun your character is uh he's dating this season or at least attempting yeah this date. year's kind of like smooth edgar you know like uh he's like completely off the pills he's just self-medicating which allows him to actually obtain an erection again which he's very happy about and i'm very happy for him um and uh him and Lindsay decide to have a little friends with benefits action. And uh, they're both very much in a different place in their lives. The, the script's completely flipped. You know, Jimmy and Gretchen were the responsible ones. I use quotes with that because they're not really all that responsible. But now we're the responsible ones. We're the adults of the foursome. We have jobs. I have new clothing attire that I decide to start wearing, like that ridiculous damn hat you guys saw in the video. Um, and is that uh, technically a fedora or like a bowler cap? What, what is that one technically called? I don't know. I think it's a bowler. A bowler. It's Both definitely are a horrible. bowler. Yeah, Both are. we move on to fedoras. Like, it gets better <laughs> as the season goes on. Let's take a look to see if we have any... F okay, good. We're safe. None, I didn't none, make none. fun of anybody here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it was... Uh, and, and, and so it's really good. So, like, both Lindsay and, and Edgar are very much about... Uh, 
um, gaining more confidence within their personal life, working on their job, and then if they have time to bone it out, they bone it out. And if not, they say, peace, homie, I'll see you on the flip. But obviously someone's going to develop some pretty hardcore feelings because that never goes the way that it should. Or maybe it doesn't. Oh. Maybe this is the first time ever that friends with benefits are really just friends with benefits. I don't believe it. I, I you know, I mean, statistically speaking, in the rom-com or genre uh, that that your your way of thinking is right nine times out of ten but so we're, we're talking about a Stephen Falk uh, project here so we'll see one of the things that I loved about uh, how they hooked up which I, I mean I don't want to give too much away right how many episodes no. have, have none of aired right three of aired three of aired three oh, of so aired. you can actually talk about yeah yeah one. Uh, is uh, they're doing an impression of their friends when they start sleeping together yeah. it's such a disturbing uh way to <laughs> for two people to to hook up to get into it yeah yeah you know it's it's funny because it's like kind of mirroring that uh meta we are sidekicks moment from what was it season one right, like i the believe first couple episodes of season yeah one. where we realize that we're the sidekicks in whatever story that we're telling and now this time we realize we're the responsible ones and then we realize oh we miss them and then she goes to put a uh, her 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 whiskey down, and then I immediately just fall into how much I miss Jimmy, and you know, uh, put a coaster down, woman. And, you know, he does that sort of thing, and then we kind of keep going back and forth, British sort of thing. Yeah, that British sort of thing, which I didn't do very well there. Uh, but um, and, and 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 eventually they just joke themselves into boning, yeah. which you know they're just like dumb horny babies at this point. It's a good way to describe the characters on the show a lot of the time, I think. Dumb, horny babies. Dumb, horny babies. You know, you've been a part of the show, obviously, since the first episode, first season, you've been on the show all the way. Um, Stephen Falk is, is brilliant. He's an incredible writer. But yeah. what is it like when a show goes from, uh, you know, I think in season two, when it started to tackle mental illness a little bit, it got the, uh, it got sort of admired and called a brilliant show, a prestige show. Yeah. It was going after things that most shows don't go after. But now it feels like in season four, it's kind of settled into just sort of kind of casually being about these characters at the same time. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it has to kind of go for these big subjects like it did before. Have you noticed that as well? I mean, it, it's it's interesting when a show settles into just sort of allowing itself to be funny and play stories out. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I, I, season one seemed to be super zany. Season two got dark out of nowhere and and uh, allowed us to really enter a portion of Steven's mind that I don't think a lot of us knew were there um, and then season three was kind of kind of like a departure from that and we and we went into kind of I I don't even know what you could characterize it as because it was like really covering domesticity in yeah. season three there was a yeah, lot it was of all like about family yeah. You know, and then and, and then I think finally this year we're kind of getting like a culmination of all three together. Like we're really fine. We've really found our groove. It's not like there aren't dark moments or serious moments that don't happen because we wouldn't be our show without them. But it's not an overwhelming story arc. And I feel like uh, Steven and the writers have gotten exceptionally brilliant in the case of having something really serious and really funny happening at the same time so that we can cringe and laugh at ourselves while we're watching it. And we can also see uh, with these characters something, even while something funny is happening, in the background there is something falling apart in their lives or there is something about their lives that they're not coming to terms with and that is what is funny in the foreground. Yeah. That sadness that you're talking about. Yeah, you know, and, and, I, and, it's, and it's totally realistic. I mean, how many, how many situations have any of us been in where we seemingly seem to have all of it together on the outside and then, you know, if you really got to hear the thoughts that we had before or after that conversation, that situation that happened. We're just beating ourselves up about it or doing something that's Are you talking about me right now? I You're am, I about, am. I mean, I'm, I'm looking I'm, at you in the eyes, and it's like you know what's going on right now. Well, this is this is my new thing. Like, I, I don't know if you know this. If you get season four on a television show, you're able to start reading people's thoughts. Are you fucking kidding it's me? It's a fucking Hollywood thing. I didn't know it existed <laughs> until I got season four. Like, I woke up, and I heard my wife thinking, and I was like, what did you just say? And she said nothing, and I... And it started started from like, there. Ah, you got the season four telepathy. Yeah, you got yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was written in contractually. Yeah, yeah. FX sent over a writer, and it was like, oh, now I have this shit. Cool. The Wizards of Hollywood have finally <laughs> come forward and opened the gates for you. Yeah, yeah. Kanye and all those dudes in robes. What does syndication get you? Oh, I, I, I don't. Buckets of cash. That's see, all. they they don't tell you anything ahead of time. You know, they just they 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 want you to uh, find it. 
very genuinely within your lifestyle and then say, oh, yeah, this was supposed to happen for you. <laughs> so I don't know. If it's, if it's loads of money, you know, like, that'd be kind of cool. But may, I'd like to fly. Like, <laughs> instead, you know, like, I'd rather be able to have, like, the ability to fly. Or, like, control the matrix, you that, know? That'd be dope. T stop time for a second. Exactly. Like Zach Morris Ripple and it. Saved by the Bell. You know, oh. you just pop, pop in a timeout, you know, and then... But, less an, but like camp. in a less annoying way. He was always so self-assured about it. Well, yeah. Time out. Like, oh. Yeah. Well, it's good. But he was the only... Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Imagine if Screech was able to do timeouts. Those would have been so fucked up. It would have been so vengeance-based. Yeah. You know, he would have... <laughs> and, and I would feel really bad for Lark Voorhees' character at that point, because I think the show would have taken a really dark turn if Screech would have got some timeouts in there. Like, uh, he would have called timeout, everyone would have been frozen, and he would have just started doing really weird stuff to get back at everybody for the years of mistreating him and calling him a nerd. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he did that in reality, too, as, the, as a human being. I, yeah, yeah. I, well, that's what they don't tell you, that you actually get to borrow one of your castmates' superpowers after the show's done with. So maybe I'll become a cockaholic. No, I mean, time did not stand still for him, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. He attempted, and they were like, no, go to jail. It was definitely one of those slow days, slow years sort of thing for him. We were talking about this in the green room, but you're uh, you're in an upcoming film by uh, really one of the best American filmmakers who's made I think maybe two, three films in her whole career yeah. in the last thirty years. She's yeah. unbelievable. Her name is Tamara Jenkins. She yes. made uh, Slums of Beverly Hills and the, the Savages. Savages with mm -hmm. Laura Linney and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, talk about the film that, that you're doing with her. Oh, it's uh, it, it's in a it, it's it's a beautiful film. Uh, it's extremely well written, starring uh, Paul Giamatti and Catherine Hahn. They are. Um, at a point in their lives where they still want children, but it's not happening organically or naturally, so they kind of go the IVF route, and that's not really happening, and they had already kind of exhausted the um, adoption process, and that really wasn't happening, so it's kind of, you know, the aftermath of that. Like, how do, how, how do we then still obtain our lifelong dream of becoming parents if it seems like all of the routes that are available to us don't seem to be there anymore? Um, and so it, it, it's, it's really heartbreaking and beautiful from that perspective. And um, I play Sam, who is uh, Paul Giamatti's um, only employee for his pickle company. We sell pickles in, in, in Union Square at the farmer's markets on the weekends, and I end up um, falling very much in like um, with Paul Giamatti's niece, who's played by Kaylee Carter. Did you get to do any scenes with uh, Catherine Hahn? Um, no, I, I did. All, all my stuff was with uh, Kaylee and Paul, but I did get to see Catherine quite a bit on set. And uh, she is the best. Oh my goodness! I was kind of hoping, you know, you know how you hear sometimes that like, um, like, uh, uh, am I saying her name correctly? Rita Retta from Parks and Recreation. Yeah. How she was just a guest star in the pilot. But they loved her so much that they wrote her in and she became a regular. So I was kind of hoping like that would happen like within this scenario that <laughs> they, you know, that like Catherine Hunt would write you into her life as a regular. No, that yeah. Tamara was like, oh, man, I love having Desmond on set so much. Let's like write some scenes for him and Catherine together. I think they would have really good chemistry or this would be like a really great scene. But, you know, that, uh, that, that unfortunately that didn't happen. She's a I mean, everybody in the film sounds incredible, but Catherine Hunt is just like this unbelievable actress right now. Um, did you see all of I Love Dick? Uh, I've seen many episodes, not all of it, though. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, it was hard because I, I don't want to sound like uh, uh, ageist, but whenever her husband would be, like, beaten off while she was, like, telling a story, like, it kind of, like, made me tune out a little bit there. Yeah, Griffin Dunn, Victor. Yeah, not that I, I hope Griffin Dunn gets it. I hope he gets it all the time. I just don't <laughs> think I want to see him get it on screen. There were some elements of I Love Dick that I was also kind of like, I don't need this. Yeah. I don't need this. But I did like to feel like that level of uncomfortability because I kind of feel like that's what she was kind of going through in a different sort of way. So I felt like I was actually viscerally connecting with her character and not in the same way, but in a very similar sort of way. Um, I want to go back to You're the Worst for a second because you're, you're in the fourth season. At this point, do you... You know, do they approach you at all for like how you want to see where you want to see Edgar go, or any ideas that you might have, or do you kind of just hang back and are like, you guys have really done an amazing job from here. I don't really want to. I don't want to step in and ruin anything. Yeah, for the most part, I do a lot of hanging back. You know, I mean, um, uh, I, I I inherently trust Stephen and his vision. I think everything that he's written thus far is is turning out very well, and I I don't really want to 
influence some great idea that he might already have with some bonehead idea I might have. Every once in a while, I do text him, like, wouldn't this be dope as, like, a breakfast item? Like, something that I could, like, cook. Like, every once in a while, I throw those in. and Something uh, that doesn't really affect the overarching no, narrative. No, 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 no. I have, you know, I, ha I have been pushing for... Uh, hey, I'm participating. Can I make eggs in the morning on this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I wish breakfast sushi had been my idea. But oh, ever right, since then, great. like, I just try to, I, like, see things. And I'm like, yo, what about breakfast this? And he'll be like, uh, that's already a breakfast item. It's this. Uh, I don't have a great example for you at this time, but so, the, but I have been like trying to trying to um, uh, get uh, Lin Manuel on the show because the whole internet world seems to think that every time they discover it, they're the first ones to discover that Lin and I have similarities and likenesses <laughs> between our face and our voices. But I would, th I, I that, that's the only thing I've really been pushing to like get him on because Edgar has talked about his older brother at some point, and I just think that would be really cool to work with my buddy Lin. How have you, uh, how have you reached out to Lin? Um, I saw him at uh, Joe's Pub. Uh, they were doing a Freestyle Love Supreme show there, and I just told him about it real quick. This was pre-Hamilton, by the way, so he was like seemingly down for it at the time i now I, i'm sure he has no time to come hang with us and when you told him about it initially he was like sounds great i'll be wherever you want me to go that yeah, sounds wonderful like, he says, sounds good oh what you guys shoot in la uh what, what like may to september like yeah i think i could work that out no, it's and like sorry i'm busy for five years yeah it's like i'm writing moana 12 right now <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience right here thanks hey, for being up? here um so not a lot of actors get the opportunity to play the same character over many seasons um what are some of the challenges of playing the same character for four seasons now or if there are none, that's no, fine no, no, too. no. There, there, there definitely are. Like, kind of, kind of keeping it fresh, kind of not going to like the same sort of way you would kind of like try to unwrap a joke and deliver it, you know? Because um, there's definitely we all get into we have cadences, you know, and it's always about like trying to like get outside that box. Luckily, the writers give us, you know, am amazingly crafted material that whatever you know, sort of like go-to we have, like immediately gets stripped away from that. So we're lucky on that point. But I, I, I think that's like the biggest challenge of like how to expand the character without losing at its core who he actually is, but like making him more well-rounded and continuing to peel the, the onions back, the onion layers back. But peel, the, peel, peel onions too. Just it's got to be so hard, and you see this with a lot of TV shows, not with you or the worst. It's got to be so hard to retain that core of the character without starting to re repeat the same sort of conflicts yeah. for that character. I mean, you yeah. see that with a lot of shows. I won't name names, but there's one particular show that's on right now where every season it feels like they just keep repeating the same different variations of the same conflict because they don't really know. They have a very limited core in terms of who these characters are. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, luckily Steven's not really interested in that, you know, I mean, for, 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 for us. I mean, I guess if the material was consistently the same, like within like the same parameters, then it would be even more difficult for me to try to find ways to not make it stale or make it old or make it um, telegraphical. <laughs> Fourth season. Is that Telepathy. a word? Yeah. Um, but no, yeah. So Steven's not at all interested in that. You know, I mean, he wants, you know, specifically with Edgar, we're really trying to tell a veteran story that we haven't seen on television before. And part of that story is that, you know, he's a real actual human being with wants, needs, likes, and he's just not sure how to navigate through them. And, and, and that's what we see. So like sometimes I feel like Edgar, like specifically this season, isn't making quite of like a dramatic jump as he, a, a, as we did last season, but it's kind of nice to be in like more day to day type things. What is it like telling a veteran story that doesn't necessarily have to do with patriotism or, or, or dealing with, you know, any of the wars that are going on right now in, yeah. in and of itself. It seems like the only veteran stories that we tell in this country, for the most part, are ones of, uh, you know, uh, it's incredibly hard to readjust, which it is for many veterans, or, right. and, it, and, it, and it was for Edgar at one point, or, you know, a, a kind of patriotic hero worship veteran story as well. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's extremely freeing. And from all of the vets that I hear from online or that I see and meet in person, um, particularly like their family members, I actually get quite a bit of uh, direct messaging um, on social media from uh, loved ones who are dealing with either their husband or, their, or, or their, their wife or their child or their uncle or something that is dealing with combat PTSD and how we have kind of 
given them um, a platform in which to bring things up with and to actually build out the conversation so that they feel a little bit more comfortable addressing some of these certain issues. So, I mean, that's been, I mean, that's been pretty amazing, you know, because... Well, Stephen did a great job of making it a story, but not his only story. Right. Well, because, I mean, uh, we are so consumed with putting people in boxes. Yeah. You know, like, even though I'm ethnically ambiguous and I'm Italian, Greek, and Puerto Rican, you know, there's a large part of Hollywood that only sees me as Latino. And there's a large sector within that sector of... Of, of Hollywood that only sees me as like what a stereotypical Latino could be, which is like a drug dealer or a rapist or a guy who mows lawns or something like that. So like within the fictional world that I live, I'm always trying to break out of these stereotypes and then even more so within my regular life. So I, 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 I would really hate it if, if we made Edgar's story all about he's just a vet because he's so much more than that. He's had way more life experience. A lot of his life experience is because of the eight years he served while he was over there in Iraq. But that's not all all he is, you know? I mean, he's he's a, he's a lover. He's a hopeless romantic. He's a, he's a foodie who used to be obsessed with Rachel Ray. He's a goofball. Um, he's a goofball, you know? And, and this year we see a little bit more of smooth Edgar. You know, he's finding himself more confident, a little bit more sexual in ways that we haven't seen before. So we're, like, actually getting to see a real person rather than just a stereotype of what that is. Let's get another question from the audience who is right here. Hey, how are you? Hey, good, how are you? Doing well, thank you. So what would you say is your favorite quirk of Edgar and who do you think you have the best chemistry with on set? Uh, my favorite quirk of Edgar, I always like when something comes up and then all of a sudden he gets like a flashback in his head of his time in the Paktika province or somewhere and he starts to go down a rabbit hole and then Jimmy usually immediately dismisses it and like kind of takes him out of there. I just, I like the real quick transition that happens within that and I think it's really funny. And Chris and I always get a real, real big kick out of that. So that's cool. Um, and then, you know, Pardon me. Um, seltzer water does it every time. Um, <laughs> but um, you, we, we, we all have really, really phenomenal chemistry. I, I would have to say that I, I, I think because we've gone through so much together on the show that I think Heather and I probably have um, um, the, the best sort of chemistry at this point um, just because we've we've kind of taken it really all over the map, you know? Like, we were really, like, big and caricature -y with each other at first, and then she started manipulating me and using me, which is, like, a really awesome dynamic to play at for a little while. And then I saw her put a turkey baster up her vagina, and I tapped out of that. And then I got to kind of, like, go away and choose to push her away and not, not be friends with her, but decide not to be interested in her again. And now we're at this point where we're finally on equal footing. So I feel like we have, like, really mimicked, you know, like a real sort of, like, relationship. I feel like I went through this in my early 20s with someone that I was crazy about at some point. So it feels, like, very natural and realistic to me. I think I have time for one more question. Who, right here. Hi. Hi. Um, so I know you mentioned wanting to have Lin-Manuel on, but is there any guest star that you had previously that you would like to see make another return? Oh, uh, one that we've had on that we would like to see make another return. Um, you know, I had such an amazing time working with Julie White last year and um, uh, Bradley. Oh, man, I hate that. I can't remember his last name, but he was the tow truck driver in um, episode five of last season, 22, which was like the Edgar episode. I had such a phenomenal time working with both of them. Like, I... At, at one point, I remember in scenes with both of them that we would be talking and all of a sudden, like, I would zoom out and watch myself be in a scene with them. I had never, I, I've, I've never wanted so much to just be an audience member while I was in a scene with someone before. I just thought they were just, like, amazingly dynamic and present and with me at all times. And so it was it was continuing to, like, really affect me that at some point, like, I zoomed out and I wanted to see what myself looked like in that 
and that sort of dynamic. So I would love to get the chance to work with one of them again, for sure. How often do you have that experience when you work with other actors that you're like, oh, I wish I was watching what we were doing right now because this yeah. feels good? Yeah, um, a couple of times. Uh, that happened with Paul Giamatti. Uh, on Private Life, for sure. So I'm interested to see what those scenes look like. But that's uh, so interesting to see what those scenes look like afterwards because what you're feeling in that moment is not going to be the feeling when you watch them. No, but, you know, it's like I can... You, you, it's like some actors like like can say, like, oh, that's the take that they used for that. Like, I think I'll be able to see physically because, like, I can... You know, I remember what it was like to be there even though to the naked eye who wasn't there... Where I would think like, oh, he just, you know, did really well in that scene, was really believable in that scene. I enjoyed the story that they were telling, but I remember kind of like what was going on there. So I, I you know, hopefully I'll be able to like kind of maneuver it. The other time that I had that sort of experience was my very first film in New York City after I moved here. It was with Jim Carrey and Mr. Popper's Penguins. And he was such a huge influence for me, you know, like as a young kid and early, early adolescent that like I was very nervous for the first time ever to be in a scene with someone before. And I've never like felt that sort of nerve, nervous reaction that I was having that I rem I can see in like some of the scenes that I was having with him that in my eyes, I'm freaking the fuck out. <laughs> but no one else can like really see that. But I knew I was freaking the fuck out. Like Do you know that you were freaking out? No, he had he, he had no idea. Although at one point I I I, I had this imagine and this like whole like running imagery going on in my mind that I just thought Jim improvised so much. I just, I, I, I could just feel it from seeing all of his films, from, you know, Ace to Eternal Sunshine, uh, Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That it, like he just, he, he, of course he improvises. Like who can be like that, like that crazy comedically good? Like that has that, and it's not. It's all very thought and well planned out. Like we did, I don't know maybe 20, 20 to 25 takes of like every size, every time, and every five, every five to seven takes, we would stop, we would go back with, with the director, Mark, um, into, the, in, into, the, into the room, and we would watch them. And he would start super, super small, like I was working with like the greatest dramatic actor of all time. And by the time we got to take 25, it was way over the top, really big, really physical, you know, what Jim Carrey's known for about, you know, making his body contort and do a whole bunch of things. And it was really amazing as an actor, like having to react to that, because I don't know what take that they're going to use, but I know that whatever I have needs to be able to match to seem like I'm in that world with him. So, like, that, I, the whole time that I was there, like, I was really zooming out because I wanted not only to remember it for future usage, but to, like, really, like, like pinch myself, like, am I here doing this at this time? And he couldn't have been more generous. Like, some of the funnier things that I did in that movie were his suggestions. Like, he would be really digging what was happening, and then he'd be like, hey, you know, it'd be really funny at this, poem, in this moment. Like, like, you're going blind. He was like, go full Helen Keller on this shit. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah, just don't touch my hair, but wherever else you want. <laughs> like, that was it. He didn't want me to touch his hair. And I, like, stuck my finger up his nose, and he, like, he reacted to it, and, like, that didn't make it into the scene or anything. Don't touch my but, hair. yeah, just, like, don't touch my hair. And it was just, like, that, that, that was, like, that, that was a pretty amazing moment right. there. He's like, I don't want to have to do the makeup chair again later. Yeah, today, no. I mean, because he has his own hair person. It's not, you know, like, we come in to you're the worst, and there's been someone who's hired to do our hair. Luckily, it's been the same people the entire time, so we have amazing relationships with them now. But, like, Jim has his own makeup and hair people that go and travel with him. And so it's kind of, it's, it's you definitely don't want to be pissing those people off, you know, like they're like Jim Carrey's hair and makeup people, man. Did, it, did he, you know, you said he did 25 takes and he started small and worked his way up gradually. Did he, did, it, did they explain to you that that was going to be the case? And no, did I they had, want you to sort of like almost like natural reaction to each take. And then, you know, by take 12, you were like, oh, I, I see what we're doing here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and, and I thought. That's if we went into kind of like an improvised sort of set that Jim might want me to improvise with him and to continue keep elevating it. But he's like so rhythmically timed that if it that if we seem to like jump out of what his rhythmic timing was on his side, 
that he would stop and say, well, I, I need to go back for a second. Like, I just want to be able to get this. Like, he was just so specific about every single take. And then when we got over to me, they just wanted me to riff all over the place. Like, we got what was on the page, and then be like, we'd go back and look and be like, Jim did this here kind of in these takes. Like, so do whatever you were thinking then, do it now sort of thing. And so it was like, it, it was That's really it, hard. It was, it, was, it was like being in, like, acting surgery. You know, like you. That's laying a lot of the responsibility at your feet in the, for the scene. Yeah, which I, you know, I mean, I appreciate. I, I mean, I grew up with like Michael Jordan being probably like one of my greatest idols as a kid from Chicago, and watching the Bulls win six championships, two three peats, and I always thought to myself, you know, like I want to be him one day. I want to be the guy who wants the ball in the final twenty seconds, you know, in the game. And so, so in this scenario, you're Michael Jordan, not Jim Carrey. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jim Carrey was definitely Scottie Pippen in yeah. this scenario. You hear me, Jim? You're Scottie Pippen. No, not at all. But you know, it's just kind of like they they entrusted a lot in me, you know, and 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 it feels really good when you have that when you're acting against someone that you've admired for and has influenced you for so long and working on a big sort of studio film that I've never worked on before. Up until that, I'd only worked on a couple of indies and some student projects. Yeah. So, and those are like really heavily collaborated, you know, whereas this, you know, you think like, oh, like I just don't want to fucking get fired. Right. You know, like I don't want to do something to piss somebody off and get fired because, you know, with big studio projects, you know, it that casting director brings you to the next thing or someone right. remembers you. Right. Yeah. And you don't you want don't to be remembered as on this project as a guy that got fired. Yeah. Oh, that that's that guy that couldn't hang with Jim. We can't we can't put him in anything else of like this level or this caliber. Yeah, you know, you don't want that. And I, I was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't. Yeah, you definitely don't want that. But I was very thankful that they were that they had enough trust in me from the beginning and the relationship that we kind of built over the scenes that we did, like it got stronger and, you know, there was more thought about, well, what do you think about this sort of thing? And uh, Jim's like, I'm kind of going with this timing sort of, you know, like I actually had conversations with him about like scene breakdown and stuff, you know, I, I didn't, it had never happened before. It hasn't really, no, because Paul was amazing about that too. I'm just trying to think of people that are maybe like at that level that I've worked with since then. Um, I guess there really hasn't been too much more. Um, but in the television world, there isn't a lot of time for that. Oh, yeah. You know, unless if you're on Veep, because yeah. they do... Months, like a month of rehearsal or whatever beforehand. Yeah. 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 And then they're still making things up while they're on set, and they just keep on letting the cameras roll. Whereas on this, you guys kind of get your sides that day, and you get this, or you get the script probably like a week beforehand, and then sides on the day. Yeah. And you have to move extremely fast. I mean, you said you were Quick. shooting episode four, Four two months ago. Yeah, well, so we get them. We get them at blocks at a time. So we shot episodes one, two, three, and five in three and a half weeks all together, and it's broken down where like it's based on location. So we could be shooting, you know, in Echo Park at some place, and there's a scene there from one, there's a scene there from three, and I'm also there again in five. And so we have to kind of have what the scope is. There's like a All new writer way. and a new director at each location. No, no, no. We have the same director um, doing the block. That's doing the block, oh, right. and our writers are so amazing. We've had the same ones the entire time, all four years, so we've gotten to know each other really well, and Steven's always on set, whether he's directing or he's just there show running, so that there's always this great level of continuity that's happening. If we have any question or we feel like we're kind of really going off base, we just look over to Steven and uh, Shane and Franklin, who are two writers who are now executive producers on the show, and we just chat about it, and we like look through the script and be like, this is what we were going for there. So maybe this choice is a little far out of reach for this. Maybe we need to just dial it back in a little bit because we don't want to, like, blow the load too quickly before the arc, you know, takes full shape. That's so cool. It's such a tight-knit group at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, you know, and everyone says it. Oh, we're like family. We're like fam I mean, everyone within our cast definitely does, but you hear it from, like, so many, so, so many people, and I feel like you really get that opportunity now that there's so many different types of stories being told on so many different platforms that people get to really become invested in the story that they're telling. It's not just a job for making money. Like, you're actually, like, a you know, a, a theater kid all over again where you're just wanting to tell the playwright's story to the best of your ability. And we're, like, actually getting to do it, but, you know, with a camera and an amazing network behind us, and they just kind of let us go. 
That's awesome, man. I yeah. love the show. Congrats on Thank the fourth you. season. Appreciate uh, it. You're the worst airs on uh, Thursday nights, right? Wednesdays. Excuse, Wednesdays. Wednesdays. Dude, I'm really bad at the details here. No, that's <laughs> I'm okay. I'm all about the interview. I, I don't, don't know the days. Well, there's times, yeah. days, no, no, months. Promote the time people are going to go watch. No, it. no. It's, so Wednesdays. It, 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 uh, Wednesdays before Trump tweets at 3 a.m. and <laughs> post whatever ridiculous shit happened that day. <laughs> Desmond, thanks so much for being here, man. Thank Good you, to man. see you. Appreciate Thank it. you so Thank much. You for having me.